Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you made. Lord, and we thank you for each person that's listening right now. Lord, and we pray that you would take all of our burdens, Lord. We pray that we would just lay them at your feet voluntarily, Lord, because you're the one that can help solve our problems anyway. Lord, we yes. pray that you would open up our minds, Lord, open up our eyes so we can see Jesus more clearly. We can see the love that you have for us, and we can see the way that you're going to provide for us this coming week. Lord, whatever trials we face, uh, and Lord, whatever opportunities, Lord, that we would be willing, uh, open up our eyes so we can see opportunities to serve you, to live it out seven days a week, 24-7. We ask, that, ask now that you use Pastor Izzy to encourage each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord, guys. If you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, last week we got just to read the first two verses to see what Paul's determination was. And, uh, you know, that thing that, it, when, when we have something we've determined to do in our mind, it's... um. It's a good thing when it's a spiritual thing we've determined. Some of us might have determined to sin when we were younger. Not, not now. You're not doing that, I hope. But, uh, but I know I did in my youth. I would, like, wake up and figure out which sins and how many times and, uh, and like, you know, go. That, I called it my fun for the day. And, and that wasn't good. But Paul, we saw his determination was different than that. And I, I find it really interesting. This is what we're going to pick up today. If you look at verse 2, Paul says, I determined to know nothing amongst you except for Christ crucif and him crucified. He said, I, I, this is my determination, that you, among you, there, there's nothing else I want you to know except that Jesus Christ died for you. He was crucified for your sins and when you know that, when you know what Christ did for you on the cross, when, when Jesus died, remember the last three words he said on the cross, three words he said, it is what? Finished. And Paul knew that the power of the gospel is really found in the fact of what Christ did on the cross. You know, the Jews, they had all that instruction about all the sacrifices that would have to be made every time they sinned. They'd have to go and confess their sin uh, and they would put their hand on the head of the animal that was being sacrificed and it was to say well I'm transferring my guilt of my sin my shame to this animal and this animal now has to pay with its life the Bible teaches the wages of sin is death and that the that the life is in the blood so so to cover death you had to cover it with life and so they the Jews they were taught this or can you if you were brought up Jewish and you knew this every time you sin if it was a big sin you had to get a bigger animal smaller sin you got a couple small animals whatever a couple turtle doves but you still it cost it cost life Now if you've ever had to take the life of an animal you lived on a farm like I did growing up you know there's certain animals like I didn't like no problem but the ones I did you know, you get, you get, it's weird. You get fond of the ones that you, you know, raise from watching them be born and then grow up and then it comes slaughter time and you're just like, oh, I don't want to do it. You know, but it's part of living on a farm and, you know, doing that. And, and just to, to have an animal die because you knew you sinned and that, that sin carried with it guilt. And to pay for that, it had to be paid with the blood of that animal. Well, that's why it was so important in the, in, the, in the scriptures when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, he was called, who takes away the sins. Well, not who covers the sins, but takes it away. So when Paul came to Corinth, this church, what we talked about, they're in a really spiritually dark place. It'd be like going to Las Vegas, okay? Of the ancient world. It was, the, it was known as the, you know, really... The really corrupt. It was a. It, it had a lot of a lot of um, traffic commerce going through. It had a lot of sh sailors coming to the ports. So it had this, um, you know, the brothels and all the bars and the stuff going on. And it was actually. Uh, I've said, shared this before, but some folks weren't with us. If you called someone a Corinthian back then, it was like it was a dig. It was like you you know you're you're a reprobate. You're a you're just a really wicked super sinner, you know? 
and it, it, but it had a, all the negative connotation you could put with it. And so it wasn't a, a compliment, but God put a little church in this dark place spiritually to shine. And I've shared this before. It only takes a little bit of light when it's dark to see your way. I mean, I learned this from Keone, our youth leader. He took his cell phone one day. He was living on our lanai, and we have stairs that you have to go down a half a flight and then turn and go down the other half the flight. And, and to, get, to get down the stairs in the dark, you know, you can do it by Braille, but it's not that safe. And I, one day I see this little glowing light going down the stairs, and it was his cell phone. All he did was touch the front. He didn't have that flashlight app. He just touched the front of the screen and put it on a like note thing, a white thing, and just went like that. And, he, and just that little bit of light, in, uh, when it's really dark, it's amazing. You don't really need like a ton of lights to see, but it's just enough to light your way. And God was using this little church as a light in this really dark community. So Paul says, guys, I, I determined that I would, that my determination, that, that you, you would know Christ and you would know him crucified. You would know where the power of the gospel is. Now, remember, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he was studied, like we would say, out the kazoo. He was, had his doctorate in theology. And yet he didn't, like, fall back on all of those let me, you know, wow you with my fancy, you know, verbiage about God and let me give you this really complicated message. Look at verse 1 of this chapter. He said right here, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. He, he said, I didn't, I didn't make it like, you know, real fancy. I just called it straight what it is. Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. There's the one that paid for our sins. And he says, and I determined to know nothing else than this. He says, and when I was with you, in verse 3, he says, I was with you in weakness. And I was with you in fear and much trembling. Now, some folks don't know the story, what Paul's journeys, you know, how they went. And, but we, we get to cheat. We, we have the book of Acts. It tells us about his missionary journeys. It gives some of the background to them. And in the book of Acts, I love the book of Acts because you kind of see the real rubber meets the road of their Christian adventure, you know, in the early church, how things went down. And Paul says, you know, I was with, if, with, with well, he says, with fear and much trembling and in weakness. Now, some guys don't realize this. I mean, you read about Paul, he seems like he, he would write from jail things like, pray for me to have more boldness in preaching the gospel. I'm like, why are you praying for boldness? You're so bold, you got thrown in jail for the gospel. I mean, hardly seems like you got a problem with boldness. But yet, he's... He's saying, guys, pray that I would continue to stay bold. But when you look at Acts 18, yes, well, just turn with me to Acts. I want to show you something. Today is going to be a little bit of background. Since we're just really kicking off the book of 1 Corinthians, if you, the more you know about the background to this church, you will get so much more out of reading this letter. Because you'll kind of be able to put yourself into this story like, okay, you got a bunch of folks that are living in a really corrupt society. They're trying to be a light, you know, but, you know, if you're, if you're surrounded by carnality all the time, does it have a, a way of trying to creep into your life and rub off on you? I mean, this is what he's up against, but he's going he's gonna to address some of the carnality that actually will creep into this church coming up. But I want you to see the background so you know what's going on. Now, Paul, in, in Acts 18, Paul, he winds up going, he's, he, on, his, on his second missionary journey, Paul actually um, passes in, in, into Corinth, and he stays in Corinth. We're, we find it in Acts 18, verse 11. He says that he settled in Corinth for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Some folks don't realize this missionary journey, they think it's just like a little, they see the little dots on the map and a little line, and they think, oh, I just zipped around, you know. But you, you add this, his time travel for these journeys. They weren't short back then. It wasn't like you just hopped a plane or a train to go. You had to hike. You had to hoof it from place to place. And he gets to different places. And in some places, we find out that we know from the, from the hints of, the, of what he writes, he says, I bear you witness that, that you guys really had a great love for me when I got to you. He says, I, my eyesight, my eyes were having such troubles. He says, I, you showed me such love. I bear witness that you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me if it was possible because of the pain I was in. 
Now somehow Paul, Paul must have encountered some suffering in his travels, that he picked up something. They say in that Mediterranean region there's some kind of thing that attacks the eye and it makes it start to weep and like, like a weepy pus that just can, like a really bad, I, I forget the name of it, but I remember learning this years ago that, that he probably contracted this and the only thing they could tell him to do in that t day was get away from the shoreline where it's moist and go inland. And so, if you look at Paul's missionary journey, he's all along the coastlines doing his traveling by boat, and all of a sudden, he hikes inland into Asia Minor, and he stays inland for a long time. And some people don't realize this. What, what, what was he doing? You know, like, why did he go over there? And he writes that he came to Corinth because of much fear and trembling. Now, you wouldn't know this unless you read the book of Acts. What was making him afraid? What was going on in Paul's life? He's preaching the gospel. He's traveling around. He's sharing the good news of the Lord. And we look at, let me just show you in Acts 18. Today I'm not going for, for, for my wife will say, inching along in Corinthians. But this is to give you the background from Acts. So, so today is a lot of Acts to get to, this, to the point that's coming up in, in, Cor in the book of Corinthians. He says, after these things, Paul left to Athens and then he went on to Corinth. In verse 2 of Acts chapter 18, it says, And he found a Jew named Aquila. And it says, And a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And because it says, and this is why they, Priscilla and Aquila left, by the way, Italy. Because no one leaves Italy on purpose. I mean, well, no, my, my grandfather did. But listen to why they left. It says, Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so they came, he came to them. And because he was of the same trade, Aquila was a, a tent maker, it says they stayed on and they were working together. And so for this, it says, and, and Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath. And he was trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks about Jesus. And so it says, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself strictly to and completely to the word of God, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Christ. And so when they resisted and they blasphemed, Paul shook out his garments and he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. Look, I told you the, 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 the gospel straight. You don't want to receive it. This is, by the way, sometimes this is an attitude that I have to pay attention to, is if you tell someone and they don't want it, we're not good at doing the, I shake my, you know, thing off and I move on. We, we like kind of go, oh, let me try again. Or let me see if I can get a different approach. Or maybe you just need it. Paul is showing us, look, if they, if they don't want to hear it, don't just shake. Shaking of the garment was like saying, all right, I shake the dust off my feet. Goodbye. I'm moving on. I'll go to someone else who does. And the older I get in the Lord, the more I realize there are people who want to hear this. So why sit there and force it down the throat of someone who doesn't want to hear it? Because if they don't want to hear it, do they actually hear? No. I mean, they might hear words, blah, 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 but the message doesn't get in. And so Paul had done his, his preaching to the Jews there, and he just went, and, and the Gentiles alike that had gathered at the synagogue, and they didn't listen. So he just went, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. Now, the only way he could say he was clean is that he did preach to them. They didn't receive it. So he's being clean just like the prophet in the Old Testament when the, when the Lord spoke to him said, you warn the people when I tell you warn them. And if you warn them and they don't heed the warning, then their blood is on their own heads. But if you don't warn them, what did he say to the prophet? Do you remember in the Old Testament? If you don't warn them when I tell you to warn them, then their blood will be on your head. So Paul didn't shrink away from warning them. He told them like it was, but he said, look, I'm clean now. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. Now he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus. Titus Justus was a worshiper of God, it says, and his house was next to the synagogue. Now Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians when they heard, were, be, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Do not be afraid any longer. 
But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And then we get to verse 11, and he settled there for, for a year and six months, teaching them the word of God amongst them. So Paul was, you know, why, why would God come to you in the night and say, don't be afraid? Just a, just a, I know this is like rhetorical kind of question, but like, why would God have to bother to have you? It, it, do you think he was afraid? He had to have been. He had to have been afraid when he was at Corinth. When, when he turned from preaching to the Jews and said, I'm going to go to the Gentiles now, there was a fear in him. And God had to, to come to him in the night and say, listen, don't be afraid. I'm with you. They're not going to harm you here. Now, had Paul been harmed before this? Those of you students of the book of Acts, had he encountered any suffering for the gospel yet? On his previous <laughs> stoning to death, thrown over the wall as dead, you know, little, just a few minor inconveniences. You know, yeah, he, he had. And, and he, he, he says, the, 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 the Lord showed him in that night vision, it's okay, I'm with you. And he went on and he taught them the word of God. Now, I always ask, who would volunteer to go listen to Paul teach for a year and a half? Like, I mean, how good would that be for the church to grow? Here's this little church. Now, this, this is why I want you to know the background to the church, because this is their roots. They wind up with Paul the Apostle as their resident pastor, you know, missionary dude who stays there teaching them the Word of God for a year and a half. You get Paul teaching you for a year and a half, this guy's got command of the Scripture. And he's telling them about Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. The one who, well, it'll, I'll come back to it when I get to Corinth. The stuff that he's going to pass on is the stuff he learned from Jesus to them. So here, he, it says, listen to verse 12. I still want a few more things out of Acts to glean before we go back to Corinthians this morning. He says, but while Galileo was the proconsul of Acacia, it, it says, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul. And they brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If this was a matter of wrong, or this was of a vicious crime, he says, O oh Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are such questions about words and names in your own law, he said, You look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to judge these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Galileo was not concerned about any of these things. Now Paul was, Paul was spared right here because he was about to give his defense and the guy goes, I don't want to hear this. And then they wind up beating the leader of the synagogue, not him. Paul gets, he, this is one of the few times he escapes the beaten, you know, and, and, but it says then Paul, Paul then remained many days longer, or having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren, put out to sea for Syria, and with him there was Priscilla and Aquila, the, the tent makers, they, they went with him, and in Centuria he had his hair cut, he was keeping a vow it says, and then they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. And he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he, he didn't consent. But he took leave of them. He said, I'll return to you again if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. And then he landed there at Caesarea. And he went back and greeted his church down in Antioch. So this is the end of the second missionary journey. Paul founded the church at Corinth and then went off to Ephesus just for a short Stay And the people in Ephesus wanted him to stay, by the way. They wanted him back. Well, if you read the next chapter, he's going to you know, go to his home church in Antioch, stay for just a little while, and then say, you know, we ought to go back and check on the guys. And he will wind up keeping his word. He said, if the Lord wills, I'll come back to you guys at Ephesus. He goes back to Ephesus in the next chapter, and he winds up staying there for two years, pastoring in Ephesus. And... While he's in Ephesus, just to tie this all together for you, that's when he writes the letters, 1st 
and 2 Corinthians. 57 AD, 58 AD, he writes the, those two books were first and second Corinthians that we're studying. So just to tie it all together for you, this is how the, the church was, was strengthened by Paul's influence, being there with them in Corinth for a year and a half, then leaving, going back to his home church in Antioch, turning around, going on his third missionary journey. And Paul, turn with me now to Corinthians. I want to show you something about this experience. Because Paul, when he was in Ephesus for such a time, he started writing to these different churches. He'll write the book of Romans that we studied. And he writes first and second Corinthians while he's there at Ephesus. These really, really juicy discourses that, that, he, that he shares. And here, Paul tells us in verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching, he says, they were not in persuasive words of wisdom. He, I'm not a smooth talker, he says, but they were in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.